Today I've got a nice geometry problem from a Stanford math contest that was given out to high school students. This one is from the year 1960. Okay, so let's see the setup. We have a rectangle. I haven't labeled the vertices of the rectangle because we don't really need to. And inside of that rectangle we have a point which is I've called P. Furthermore, we know the distance from P to these vertices is given as follows. So it's five units from this bottom left vertex, 14 units from this top right vertex, and then 10 units from this bottom right vertex. And then our goal is to find how far it is from the last vertex. So I've said it's X units from that last vertex. Now I know this isn't exactly to scale because it looks like these 10 units are larger than these 14 units, but this diagram is sufficient for us to solve this problem. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. Well, since we've got rectangles and triangles within rectangles, we can probably decompose this into a bunch of right triangles and then use the Pythagorean theorem. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So I'll drop a line from here that is orthogonal to the bottom edge and then push it up so that it's orthogonal to the top edge. So I'll just draw little right angles here to show that it's orthogonal. And next, I'll also push a line to the left edge and to the right edge that is orthogonal. Okay. But now notice I've got some sub rectangles. I've got this sub rectangle right here, which has diagonal length 10. This one, which has diagonal length 14. This one, which has diagonal length 5. And then this one up here with diagonal length x. Which, that's actually going to be really helpful because we don't know the diagonal length of the whole rectangle at all. Okay, so now let's maybe give some names to these side lengths. So maybe we'll call this one. W1 for like width one, this one W2 for like width two. In other words, the width of the entire rectangle is W1 plus W2. Next, we'll do something similar over here. We'll call this H1 and then this H2 for the height of the first bit and then the height of the second bit. So the height of the whole thing is H1 plus H2. Okay. But now we can apply the Pythagorean theorem to each of these rectangles. Well, maybe the right triangles built into the rectangles. So let's see, maybe we'll work from here in a, count, in a clockwise configuration. So starting here, we see that h1 squared plus w1 squared is equal to 5 squared, which is 25. So let's write that down. h1 squared plus w1 squared is 25. Okay, now moving up to this one, we have w1 squared h2 squared is x squared. So I'll write that as h2 squared plus w1 squared is x squared. That's our unknown. Okay, next maybe we'll move to this one. So that's going to be h2 and w2. So h2 squared plus w2 squared is 14 squared. That's 196. Then finally, this lower right one will have h1 squared w2 squared is 10 squared, which is 100. Okay, now this might seem problematic because we have a nonlinear system of equations, but if we consider the square of each of these as our variables, this is exactly a linear system of equations, which we could write as a matrix equation and then use strategies from linear algebra to solve. Okay. So let's notice that this is the same thing as the following matrix equation. We have 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 1, 0, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, and then finally 0, 1, 1, 0 times the vector described by these heights and widths. So I've put it in this order, h1 squared, h2 squared, w1 squared, w2 squared. And then finally, over here on the right-hand side of the equation, we have that is equal to the vector 100, 
25, 196, and x squared. So I've put these in a slightly different order, but I kind of did that for a reason. Okay, great. So now we can take this matrix equation and rewrite it as an augmented matrix, which we can apply row reduction to in order to determine the solution set. So let's write this thing as an augmented matrix. So let's recall that that's just going to be the left bit will be this 4 by 4 matrix. And then the augmented bit will be an extra column, which will be our solutions column. So we'll have 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 100. I like to put a line between the 4x4 four four bit and the solutions bit, although not every author does that. And we have 1, 0, 1, 0, 25, 0, 1, 0, 1, 196, and then finally 0, 1, 1, 0, x squared, like that. Okay, so now we're in good shape. Now we want to think about row reducing this. We have a lot of ones in our matrix, so that makes row reduction fairly simple. Maybe first what I'd like to do is clear out the first column and the second column so that there's only a single one in the first column and a single one in the second column. So I can easily do that with the following pair of row operations. I'll take row two, I'll subtract row one, and that'll become my new row two. So that's going to get rid of this one right here. Then I'll do the same thing with row 3 and row 4. So I'll take row 4, I'll subtract row 3, and that's going to become my new row 4. So when doing row operations, I like to keep it with this structure. On the outside is the row that I'm changing, and on the inside is the row that is my tool. So notice here I'm changing row 2, I'm using row 1 as a tool. Here I'm changing row 4, I'm using row 3 as a tool. Okay, so under that row operation, our augmented matrix is equivalent to the following augmented matrix. So we're using row 1 and row 3 as tools, so that means those are not changing. I'll just write those down just as they are. 1, 0, 0, 1, 100, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 96. Okay, then let's see how row two changes. We've got one minus one, which is zero. Zero minus zero, which is zero. One minus zero, which is one. Zero minus one, which is negative one. Okay, and then here we have 25 minus 100. Well, that's minus 75. Okay, great. Then let's see what we get for row four. So we'll have zero minus zero, that's zero. One minus one, that's zero. 1 minus 0, that's 1. So that leaves me with 0, 0, 1, minus 1. And then finally, x squared minus 196, that's going to leave me with x squared minus 196. There's not anything that can really be done there. Okay. Now notice my first column is good because I have the pivot position at the top. My second column is really not so good if we're going for a reduced row echelon form. That's because my pivot position is in the third position. So from here, what we would like to do is exchange row two with row three. So that'll put me into my right position for this pivot in the second column. But I'm kind of running out of room. So let's maybe do that while transposing it up here, and then we'll move on to the next step. Okay, we just did a couple of row operations that showed the augmented matrix equivalent to solving this system of equations was row equivalent to the augmented matrix of that, was equivalent to the following augmented matrix. Now we want to continue putting this in row reduced echelon form. So the next thing we do is probably subtract row 4 and row 3, keeping in mind that this pivot is in the correct position already. We've got a 1 in the third row in the third column. Okay, so like I said, we'll do row 4 minus row 3. That becomes my new row 4. Again, keeping my similar strategy of the row that we're changing on the outside, the tool on the inside. So that means we're keeping row 1, row 2, and row 3 
fixed. So let's just copy those over. One, zero, zero, one, 100. Zero, one, zero, one, 196. Zero, zero, one, minus one, minus 75. And then finally, we'll have zero, 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 zero. That's from this subtraction. Notice that this minus one minus negative one canceled out. That could be problematic. But let's see what we get over here. We'll have x squared minus 196 minus negative 75. That's plus 75. That gives us x squared minus 121. Now, the fact that we've got a row of all zeros at the bottom tells us two things. If this is equal to zero, then that implies that there are infinitely many solutions where our h squareds and our w squareds are the variables. Remember, x squared is not exactly a variable with respect to this system, although we're trying to get the value for x squared in the end. If this is not equal to zero, that means that there are zero solutions. And this is all from like maybe the first week and a half of an introductory linear algebra class. So obviously we want there to be solutions. There being zero solutions means it's impossible to build a rectangle with these properties. So, but there are only solutions if x squared equals 121, because that would make this equal to zero, which tells us that x is the square root of 121, which is also known as 11. So our goal was to find the value of x, which we did, but notice that that tells us that there is a free variable. This w4 or this w2 squared is a free variable. So that means there are a lot of different rectangles that would satisfy this setup. In fact, and we could parametrize those rectangles with a variable which we would maybe call t. So let's say w2 is equal to t. Well, notice this row corresponds to the equation w1 squared minus w2 squared, which is t squared, equals negative 75. In other words, w1 is equal to the square root of t squared plus 75, or I should say minus 75. And then these rows also correspond to similar equations. So this row corresponds to h2 squared equals 196 minus w2 squared, which we called t. So in other words, h2 is equal to the square root of 196 minus t squared, and h1 is equal to the square root of 100 minus t squared. Those squareds and the square roots come from the fact that our variables here are actually the squares of these lengths. So putting all of that together, we see that we could have this setup where our width of our rectangle is given by, let's see, it's t plus the square root of t squared plus 75. And then the height of our rectangle is given by, let's see, the square root of 196 minus t squared plus the square root of 100 minus t squared. So in fact, there's this infinite family of rectangles that allow for the choice of a point somewhere in the interior with these lengths from the vertices. I want to notice that it's like a bounded infinite family because the smallest t could be is zero because the smallest t could be was z is zero and the largest it can be is 10 because we don't want a negative under that square root. So that means t is on the interval zero to 10. So t equals zero will correspond to this point being along this edge, which was originally impossible, but I think it's fine in retrospect. And then t equals 10 will correspond to this point being along this edge. And I think it's pretty interesting to see what path this point travels along as we increase this t from 0 to 10. 
and that's a good place to stop.